Torah related. So again, Parshas Kisisa and the Malchus Shlomo, the uh, second mimer, second paragraph, it begins. And if you don't have the Sefer, just listen in because I'll be reading it and translating it. Vayhi beredes Moshe mehar Sinai, Moshe lo yoda ki koran or pana. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Har Sinai, he did not know that Hashem had bestowed upon him a radiant face. So the Kirun or Panim of Moshe Rabbeinu is that Moshe Rabbeinu, his face shined. He saw the Midrash. It says in the Midrash, Midrash Tanchuma, Rabbi Truski is quoting from, Minayin Zoha Moshe Lakarni Hahod. From where did Moshe Rabbeinu, from where was he Zoha to these rate to this radiance on his face? Amru Razal, Min Hamaura. Hacham say, from the cave. Shenamar, as it says, Vayihi. Sorry, the Hoya. Ba'avur Kavodi, Visam Ticha Benikra Satsur. Hashem said to Moshe, when I pass by, when my honor, when my kavod passes by, I'm going to place you within the cleft of the rock, which was some kind of a cave that Moshe was placed into. And Hashem passed by, and Moshe Rabbeinu <coughs> Kibiyoko saw Hashem from behind, not from in front. And it was from being in that cave, in that cleft of the rock, that Moshe Rabbeinu was Zoha to the radiance on his face. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni Amar, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni says a different opinion. Haluchos <clears> Orkan <throat> Shisha Tfachim. The Luchos were six Tfachim long, six handbreadths long. Virachvan Gimel Tfachim, and they were three Tfachim wide. Vahaya, Moshe Machzik Bishnei Tfachim. So picture like a rectangle, which is six tefachim long. Moshe Rabbeinu was holding on to two tefachim on his side. Vakodesh Baruch Hu bishnei tefachim. And Hashem Kiviachal is grabbing on to two tefachim on his side. And what does that leave you with? That means utfachayim revach ve'emsa. The two tefachim in the middle, in the middle were therefore open. Nobody was grabbing them. So you got six tefachim. Moshe has two on this side. Hashem has two on this side. In the middle, it's open, open, an open area. Misham nata Moshe karne hahod. It was from that middle area where no one was grabbing that Moshe Rabbeinu was zocha to his radiant countenance. Okay, very mysterious statement. Both of them is Both of them are. Rabbi Tversky is just going to really touch on the first opinion and then much more deeply on the second opinion. Midrash the Omer Darshuni. This Midrash says, Darshan me. Uh, there's something here to be looked at, something deep. So let's take a look at the opinion that Moshe Rabbeinu received that radiant countenance from being inside of that cave in the Ma'ura. And therefore, what does that mean? Because there's a principle in our world and reality, there can't be light without having any darkness. There cannot be a revelation of Hashem's presence unless somebody first went into the cave, meaning they experienced something dark, and then after that, there's a revelation of Hashem's light. That's the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu first going into the cave and then being Zoha to the Karne Hod. There's this Mitzius in reality of Hester Panim. From that cave, from the place of concealment of Hashem's presence, that's where a person takes radiance as well. You go through that, make it through that, and from there we go to a place of light. Now, the truth is that is in and of itself a lot to talk about, 
but it's not really going to be the topic of tonight's shear. So we're going to move past that and go into what Rabbi Twersky is going to spend a little more time in. Again, we're in Parshish Kisisa. Let's try and look into the second opinion of Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmeni, <clears throat> that you had Hashem holding two tefachim and Moshe Rabbeinu holding two tefachim and two tefachim in the middle where Moshe Rabbeinu got his radiance from. From one perspective, there is an aspect of Torah which is completely and totally beyond our comprehension. This is what the Midrash refers to as the two Tfachim that God is holding. Those two Tfachim in Hashem's hands, that's the dimension of Torah which is completely beyond our comprehension. Then you have a dimension of Torah where human beings have the ability to understand it, the mochin, the mind, to grasp it. That is what the Midrash refers to as the two tfachim that were in the hands of Moshe Rabbeinu. That represents that people can hold on to that, like Moshe Rabbeinu was holding on to that. We can grasp that. We can comprehend that. So those are those, are those two tefachim. And then you have in the middle the two tefachim, which no one was holding on to, neither Hashem nor Moshe Rabbeinu. Hu chelek ha-Torah sh'adayin lo this refers to the dimension of Torah, which has not yet been fully revealed. But it will be comprehended and under, understood by those people who seek it out. There's a, a rule in the Gomorrah, a general principle, that our ancestors have left us an open space for us to achieve our own greatness. <speaking in Hebrew> that we have the ability in each successive generation to pull out more and more of those middle two tefachim which have not yet been fully grasped. So every generation has the ability to do that. And that's the idea, as we'll say, Moshe Rabbeinu got his radiance from there. That's where radiance comes from, where we take something which we're working on, which we are machadesh, we actually think of something new, a new idea, a brand new insight. That's where the kirun or panim comes from. Ki inetzri, the Torah itself, of course, is eternal. Contained in the Torah is the pathway and the guidance, the dveikus, for every single generation and for each successive generation. It's all in there. It's all in the Torah. And the challenges and the shortcomings and the difficulties of each generation. And for the refua, for those things which will heal every generation, will bring comfort and wholeness to each generation. They're all there. That's the idea of the two tfachim between Moshe and Hashem. It's the unique struggle, the unique challenge, and the unique resolution of that challenge, insights as a result of that challenge, which comes through each generation. 
and in each generation, Vodur, Trichim Legalos Oso. That has to be revealed and brought out from the Torah. It is there, but it's upon us to seek it out, to get to it, and to bring it into our lives. That's where the true light of the Torah comes from. The part where we discover our own personal relationship according to our generation. Now he makes a comment at the end, Rabbi Tversky. There are many different ways to spread the Torah. Many ways to be Marbit's Torah. Livnos yeshivos, v'chador mukhadama. One way is to build yeshivos, to build schools, and to be Marbit's Torah, to spread and disseminate Torah through that form of Torah education. That's one way. Avoyesh open acher, sharov b'nei adam mesalkin yudayin heimenu. But there's another way which many people decide not to involve themselves with. And that is to open up the words of Torah, the letters of Torah, to illuminate the hearts of the specific and unique generation that we live in, and to try and find and discover the healing, comforting, completing nature of the Torah's resolutions for each and every generation. And Matwiski says, that's also a form of Harbatah's Torah. It's not just how much Torah you teach, how much Torah you teach in an institution of Torah. That's part of it, a significant part of it. But there's the Torah, which is what's happening in our generation. What's going on with us, with our lives, with our children, with our marriages? What's happening? What are these challenges that, we li- that we're living with? And what does the Torah have to say about it and teach us about overcoming these challenges, rising above them, growing through them, bringing light into our lives as a result of these challenges? That's another facet of Harbatzah's Torah. Those are the two tefachim in the middle that the Midrash is talking about, according to Rabbi Tversky's insight. Yehiratzon shen nizkeh kulanu bimehera laorizeh. May it be Hashem's will that we all be zoha speedily to this light, to that unique light of Torah which shines into each and every successive generation. Ken yehiratzon. Okay, so we'll stop there for a moment and see if anybody has any questions or comments? Okay, we all set with that so far? Okay, yes, Nissan, okay. That was a hand up, that was a thumbs up. Okay, thumbs up. Okay, all right, so what we're gonna do is we'll take a look at two stories this week. We have time to do two. Uh, from the Milwaukee Rebbe, Harav Yaakov Yisrael Tversky, is her tzaddik libracha. And they go as follows. One of his grandsons, Rabbi Nsin Yehudalayb, son of doc, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Tversky, said that at the wedding of Rabbi Berish and Rivki Gans, Shlita, That was the last wedding that Milwaukee Rebbe attended. Rivka was his granddaughter, my Rebbe's daughter, Rivki Tversky, now Rivki Gans, and her husband, Rabbi Berish Gans. That was the very last chasana that the Milwaukee Rebbe attended before he passed away. He was already quite sick, and therefore they actually hurried to make the wedding sooner than was planned. And they made the wedding in Milwaukee where he lived so that he could participate. And the chuppah itself was, it sounds like near his house or at his house. I can't quite tell from the language. Yeah, sounds like it was right right at his house. 
And afterwards, the Malachi Rebbe, after the chuppah, he went into his home and many of his family members uh, followed him along into his home after the chuppah of his granddaughter. And this grandson also, Rebbe Sion, went in with them. When the Malachi Rebbe sat down in his home, he said that, Baruch Hashem, he's been zoka to see another grandchild to the chuppah. And therefore he said, he's ready to leave this world. Now at that point, many of his family members said, no, 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 don't leave yet. So as he heard them, he turned to them and he said, I know many people who raised their children, even in Eretz Yisroel, and who raised their children even amongst Gedolei Torah. And we see that unfortunately they have not followed the way of Torah and mitzvahs. And I have raised my children here in Milwaukee, which was a desolate place from Yiddishkeit until he got there. And I th I've been able to see Baruch Hashem, my grandchildren following in the way of our ancestors. And I do see that I have something I'm leaving behind after I leave this world. So kind of a moving story, really. He says, okay, uh, I'm, I w w went to this wedding for my granddaughter and now I'm ready to move on to the next world. And all the family is saying, no, no, don't, don't leave. And as far, as far as he was concerned, he felt very satisfied. And it kind of reminds me of the Pasuk in the Torah um, by Avram Avinu, that he was Ba Bayami. Uh, he came into his days, the concept of a sense of contentment with one's life. Okay, that's the first story. Uh, the second story is a, a lesson in marriage. So something we can all really pay attention to. So it goes like this. I, I have heard this story a couple times over the years about the Milwaukee Rebbe. Now we'll see it inside of the book here from Rabbi Yanki Nisan. When his final illness uh, became very serious and the doctors told him that they could perhaps treat him with chemo, chemotherapy. However, the Milwaukee Rebbe himself was very knowledgeable medically and about medical issues. And he said to the doctor, uh, you know that the growth is in a place where the chemo is not going to help. It's just gonna cause me a great deal of pain. And therefore, al pi halacha, I am not obligated to su subject myself to that kind of pain for something that's not going to heal me. And the doctor agreed with him. However, the doctor then spoke to the Rebison the Milwaukee Rebison. And he said that it's possible that this chemo will lengthen his life, your husband's life, for three months. It won't cure him, but for three months, he'll, he'll, get, he'll gain another three months. So the Rebison very much wanted that. She wanted the, those additional three months. And that was the position that she took very strongly. So a little, a little bit after that, when the Milwaukee Rebbe was by himself alone, his son, Reb Shia, Rabbi Dr. Abraham Prusky, said to him that, sorry, he said to his son, in truth, to undergo these chemo treatments in this stage of my illness, when it's not going to help me, it will only cause me great pain. Because the truth is that there's no real reason for me to subject myself to this, he said to his son. However, if I don't, it's gonna cause pain to your mother, to my rabbits and to my wife. All the years of my life, 
I have done many things in order to bring enjoyment to your mother, to my wife. Many things to give her hana, to give her pleasure. And now I have a final opportunity to do something to give her pleasure, to undergo these treatments. So I'll live another three, three months. So that's what I'm going to do. I've always tried to bring her hana'a, and this will be my last effort to be able to do so. And that's what he did. That's the conclusion of that story. I find it very meaningful and relevant on many levels. Uh, the idea that he tried in his life, you know, so hard to bring pleasure and satisfaction to his wife. And Ad Kedekach, that he's willing to undergo three months of a great deal of pain because for her, she wanted those extra three months of life for him. And that was an opportunity for him to please his wife. Okay, any comments, gentlemen?